very violent gangs, high-risk gang members, illegal guns, illegal gun trafficking, illegal gun possession, and this space, both international and domestic. Um, overlaying all of that, we have a tech lab that develops tech tools to try and leverage both prevention and intervention activities that we're doing. And then we try and roll those tools out across the country. So as is relevant to this, the um, two things I thought I would just br very briefly talk about, just as a way of introducing them, is two of the programs that we are now piloting uh, with support from the federal government. One is a program we set up at the request of the National Security Division of the Department of Justice to try and develop a mental health-based intervention for individuals who were on the pathway to mobilizing and were either arrested and incarcerated or about to be arrested, but where the FBI and Department of Justice assessed that prison wasn't necessarily a required outcome. Um, so these are people that are facing a wide range of charges, everything from the most serious terrorism charges, lending material support to the enemy or actually taking concrete steps, to what are called disruption arrests. A disruption arrest is when either the bureau or a local PD will go in and arrest somebody on a charge unrelated to terrorism, but knowing the person is in the process of mobilizing towards an act of extreme violence. Uh, we spent the better part of two years talking with everybody that would talk with us about the behaviors that were motivating the violence and then working with forensic psychologists and some psychiatrists develop a therapeutic intervention which goes by the acronym DEEP, which is a name that we inherited from DOJ. And if you know the branding world at all, once something is branded, you don't touch it, whether you like the name or not. Um, so we've kept the name DEEP. And we are now up and running in a number of facilities in New York. So we take cases literally at any level of the criminal justice system, from people who are serving time right down to people who are just for the first time being visited by the FBI. Um, the cases that we see are probably split evenly at the moment between people who are actually in pre-trial, but they're being held by the court, and people that are either under indictment or under the threat of indictment, but are not in, they are out. And then we have some people that are still pre-arrest, meaning that they've been given the option, option being an odd word in this context, because the option between being arrested or coming into our program. We can talk about the voluntary nature of that, you know, if you like, but, but we deal with that. And then some people who are just completely voluntary. The FBI will go to somebody's door, do what's called a knock and talk, and inform usually parents that their young one is doing something that's dangerous online and could use some help. And, and we will sometimes go with the agents, or they will have the ability to instantly refer us to that family. That sometimes works out and sometimes does not work out. We call that the handoff, and that's a complicated moment. How do you go from an FBI agent knocking on your door to coming to a mental health-based intervention? So we do a, a lot of work. In fact, I'd be curious about how other people are handling that, because I know we're all confronting that issue. Um, so that's, that's one program that we're doing. Um, we're still in the pilot stage. Uh, we've had a multi-year grant to do it, but like everybody else, got slammed shut by COVID. So in many ways, we're really, I mean, we're two years behind where we wanted to be, but we're really just up and running now. The other program we're piloting, um, we're partnering with Moonshot, is a online to offline intervention where we are trying to identify sites that are most often searched by people that are interested in or becoming involved with extremism and develop literally ads to put on those sites and direct them to a site that we are designing, and that site will then invite those people into an intervention. We are still in the design phase of that, so I really have nothing to report about that. Um, I think it's a big task. I, it's, I think it's a big task to move somebody literally from online into a physical offline site, um, but we are bound and determined to try it, and I, I think it's gonna work. I think it'll work at, at various levels. Um, but I really can't report much on that because it's not even up and running yet. And then to augment that, we are now in the process of training 
all of the mental health workers in the state of New York, uh, mostly through their various associations, to understand the warning signs that someone may be mobilizing, and then to provide tools to them to help them when they're doing whatever therapeutic work they're doing with someone, to also be able to address um, those factors that may indicate that someone may be mobilizing, so they can address those in those therapeutic sessions. And we're trying to augment that with community-based interventions because as we all know up here, and you probably all know, the lack of community attachment in this space is often a very big issue, so we try and augment that. So I'll, I'll end there because there are a lot of us, but those are the, some examples of some of the things we're doing in this space. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I'm going to be very, very brief, and then hopefully as we talk and our discourse moves on, I'll come back and, and talk about um, some content relevant to this panel and, and really looking at where we're talking about assessment protocols and practices um, to assess risk and other uh, typologies of concerning behavior. I, I'm more interested in this and talking about some of the considerations and limitations of those um, before we close out. And I know some folks are going to talk about tools, so it doesn't make sense for me to go first. Um, but uh, I don't know if I said my name, but that would help. Uh, it's, it's Matt Talbot. Um, I am the Workplace Violence Prevention Program Coordinator for the uh, VA in San Antonio, Texas. Be clear, I'm originally from Boston, so I'm very proud of my Northeast roots and want to let people know I'm not a Texan. Um, it, however, uh, I have to be some days. I'm also the president of the South Central chapter of the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals, so we have a few states we cover, and then I do a few other things. But that's enough for intros for three days for me. Hi, everyone. I'm David O'Brien. Can I just do that? Oh. Let's talk about psychosis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See how I did that? Yeah. Well done. <laughs> I'm David O'Brien from uh, Toronto, Canada, uh, Yorktown Family Services. And I oversee a program called ETA Estimated Time of Arrival, which is a rapid response, mobile, integrated care, interdisciplinary team that uh, engages with youth, young adults on the pathway towards violent extremism, uh, similar to um, Richard's programs, a very, very similar um, approach. So we engage with uh, people across the ideological lines. We also engage with people who are preparing and planning and have been intercepted by the police. And so they get sent to us sometimes in, in lieu of a charge or a pending charge. Uh, some of our folks are under national security investigations. So that's kind of one stream. And then the other stream is more uh, prevention. So people may present with some vulnerability factors. And so uh, early intervention, you know, prior to them falling down the rabbit hole of, um, you know, a violent act or extremism. So basically, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the tools we use. And so we work from a step care process. So meaning our most intensive services come at the end of our, 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 our stay with clients. Um, because all the clients that come to us are usually uh, pre-contemplation. So they don't want to change. They're being told to change by courts, maybe by their family member. Maybe they don't really want to go to prison. Maybe, you know, there might be some contemplation around actually following through with, with a violent attack. So primarily we see people in the pre-contemplation and contemplation stage. And our goal is to move them towards the action stage. So the first several weeks and months when we meet somebody in that stage is, is really just getting to know them, building trust. Uh, we don't really use a lot of tools at that point, with exception of, um, you know, which traditionally has been more of a law enforcement tool, but we find it really helpful for risk assessment, is the TRAP-18, and John also, I believe, in OPV uses the TRAP-18 too. So it's really looking at, you know, potential risk to the community, public safety, and uh, we, so we do that at the beginning. So we take information from referral sources, uh, we interview the client, uh, family members, and then come up with a bit of a, an assessment. All of our staff are trained on this. Um, and so basically, we do that at the beginning, and then every three months, just to keep the conversation alive around public safety. So it's not a psychotherapeutic tool, it's a public safety tool. And if we find out within the three months that there's new information that pops up, which is often the case, we then reassess. Um, so for example, we may you know, be involved with someone for a couple of months, and then they tell us something, or something else, someone in the community tells us something about public safety. So then we, we do the tool again. So it's kind of a dynamic, uh, ongoing tool. And then we measure at the end of our, uh, at the end of the participant stay in our program pre and post results to see if we've made any difference or change, and have we reduced the threat to public safety. 
So the other tool that we use that's really important at the beginning is called, something called a SAC. It's a suicide risk um, screener, essentially. So basically, um, it just measures, is there any kind of immediate suicidal risks that, are, that might be happening? That's also important in this space because often, as you know, um, our participants can be both suicidal and homicidal. So we're thinking of also public safety. Uh, we're also thinking if someone's highly suicidal, sometimes they want to take out other people with them. And clients tell us that. Uh, so it's important to really be on top of where people are at in terms of their own suicidal ideation. And then near the beginning of our treatment too, uh, we do something called the HEADS ED, which is essentially a tool that originally was created for hospitals and people being discharged from hospitals. So it looks at several domains, five domains, um, which is uh, sort of home life, um, education, activities, peers, drugs, alcohol, suicidality, emotions, and really it's measured in three ways. So each category is measured through no action needed, needs some action and then immediate action. So the goal here is, um, is to kind of look at what needs immediate action and that's where we begin to have conversations around psychosocial goal development. And then further down the pathway, um, when people are now moved into more of the therapy zone and more of the treatment zone, so this is now we're moving out of the engagement zone. So they've, they've now said, we like you guys, we trust you guys. Actually, maybe I'm more thinking about changing now. So moving along the stages of change, we use something called the ORS and uh, SRS, which is basically uh, partners in change management outcome tool. So basically measuring after each counseling session or meeting how people felt about their goals. Are they moving forward towards their goals or not? Now it looks at several domains, including uh, individual personal well-being, uh, interpersonal relationships, uh, social relationships, and overall general mental health and well-being. So this is a tool that they would do. And then uh, there's also the outcomes rating scale about how the therapist is doing or how the worker is doing. So basically, are they making a connection with the worker? And the theory behind that is that if they're connecting to us, they're more likely have the stage set for moving towards change. So trust is built, they feel comfortable, they feel safe. And then finally, something we actually, I forgot to mention, we do right at the beginning is something called a social needs assessment. Uh, so basically looking at non-mental health aspects of a person's life. Remembering we work in an interdisciplinary team environment, so we're addressing also non-mental health pieces. So food security, housing, transportation, childcare, employment, um, you know, social connections, are they connecting to religion if that's important to them, uh, social networks, and that, that kind of thing. So again, here to say that we map our tools onto where they're at in the stages of change. This is a population that's anxious, paranoid, if they're being referred by police, they think we're the police sometimes. And so we want to kind of build that relationship first before we take a deeper dive into what are some of the underlying issues that are maybe causing their pathway towards violent extremism. Great. Well, um, there's a lot of similarity between what Dave is doing and, and the nature of his organization and, and the programming and, and what we're doing at the uh, Organization for the Prevention of Violence, which I, I oversee. It's based in Western Canada. Uh, it's a non-government organization that operates three types of programming, training, research, and a psychosocial intervention program uh, that we call Evolve. Evolve um, has uh, about mid-50s clients or service participants, as we refer to it. Um, and about two-thirds of those service participants are situated in what the Government of Canada refers to as IMBE, um, which maybe commonly would refer to as far-right, maybe more accurately a combination of xenophobic beliefs, anti-government, anti-authority, uh, and misogynistic beliefs. So I'm kind of speaking from the perspective of Evolve and the intervention team, and actually before I, I came here um, uh, last week, we had a really interesting conversation with uh, a lawyer to get some advice on issues like privacy and, and how we speak to police and information sharing. Um, and I think a lot of my thinking, I'm just going <coughs> to make three quick points here. Rather than getting into the, all the tools that we're using, I'll talk a little bit about them. Um, but some of the thoughts that came out of that, that conversation is it was really um, quite interesting and, and helped me to think through um, a little bit about how we're trying to assess 
and manage uh, these individuals who are involved with violent extremism. So first observation, you know, the population we're dealing with, it's, it's highly diverse. And then, of course, like, that's not a, a surprise to anyone in this room, I'm sure. Um, rich and poor, young and old, and a lot of different pathways into violent extremism. So, you know, when we're talking about how we assess and manage risk, how we deal with it, I think that diversity needs to be reflected within a multidisciplinary intervention team that has, in effect, a bunch of tools in the toolbox that they can bring to bear um, to address the risk that exists with these, this base of service participants. Um, so aside from risk assessments and promising therapies, perhaps for me the most important thing is that we have a experienced multidisciplinary team with good professional judgment, um, who are experienced professionals, who understand this problem, who understand the unique uh, ideological feature of this problem, and that maybe in that sense, the best way to manage and assess risk exists in that versus, um, versus any one specific tool. As, as Dave mentioned, we, we, use, uh, we use TRAP-18. Um, so how do we improve our, our results in this area, or how do we improve the ability or ability to, to, uh, to manage risk. I think we need to do a better job of, of measuring impact, and that's something that we're trying to do internally within in-house, a uh, series of in-house tools. So effectively, every time a, a caseworker uh, meets with an individual who's a, a service participant, they go under a case note system and they, they manage, uh, or sorry, they, they measure change within specific life domains. So that could be something as basic as can they meet um, their, the basic necessities of life or something more specific to what we're dealing with here, you know, how's uh, black and white thinking. <coughs> and what that does over time is it shows change and potentially it shows the impact of specific interventions or therapies that we've introduced. Um, we combine that with what amounts to a satisfaction survey on a quarterly basis. We send it out to the service participants. We ask, how are we doing? What can we do better? What's the relationship like with your, your caseworker? Um, so that gives us two sources of information right there. And, and much like uh, uh, ETA, we do pre and post measurements. And combined, we think these three elements do a pretty good job of, uh, of showing you know, how we're doing, but also you know, how can we adapt as we have success or setbacks within these cases uh, over time? Second point on these risk assessments, and this really came out of the discussion that we had with this uh, the lawyer, um, is the different considerations, I think, around using, say, TRAP-18 for, for us, for like a not-for-profit, not non-government organization versus the security sector. Um, and, you know, as an NGO with roughly three years of operations in, in this area, we're honestly still figuring out where that sweet spot is um, and, and asking ourselves, you know, how can we use these tools in a way that's commensurate with our goal, which is disengagement, reintegration, rehabilitation of these individuals, but also importantly, especially for the caseworkers, how can they maintain their ethical standards in using those tools, um, their professional standards, and, and let's be frank here, you know, the use of these tools can be helpful and harmful for the service participants themselves. If you have someone in the, you know, the early stage of involvement who's had a door knock from the RCMP or the FBI, what have you, or, um, you know, they haven't breached that, that criminal threshold, they haven't been charged, and you assess them and they have very high risk, what if that information gets out? Right? I mean, there's, there is significant re, uh, risk to the service participants themselves, depending on their status within the, uh, within the criminal justice system. So how do we strike that right balance between acting as this ethical human service, um, seeking to better people's lives, individuals' and families' lives, but uh, with our ultimate priority, which of course is protecting the public from potentially catastrophic violence? Um, so th this is a really tough question, I think, um, and, and our experience so far is finding that right balance is, is difficult. Uh, final point here, we talk a lot about risk and threat assessment. I don't think we talk enough about fit and suitability of service participants for these programs. In other words, who is best suited for, for P slash CVE um, and connected to that, how do we better share the workload um, with our colleagues in the, in the security sector? Because I think there's this sort of erroneous assumption that exists that 
um, you know, when, when an individual is of a certain level of risk, not, not too high, um, you know, um, and, you know, they, they've been investigated and law enforcement has completed their investigation and said, look, they're not going to breach the criminal threshold. We're going to send these guys over to P-CVE to be, in effect, babysitted. Um, I, I think there's an alternative here, and, and I think this is a really important question, um, that ultimately suitability should be determined by needs and capacity or willingness to change within the individual rather than risk or the status of an investigation. Um, our suggestion is that all stakeholders, especially in the security sector, should be thinking about opportunities about how a cognitive opening, for example, in relation to disillusionment um, or hardship that's caused by their, their involvement in violent extremism or psychosocial opportunities. So for example, we can identify uh, a mental health disorder or an, or an area of need that we can help with with these individuals, that we should leverage these opportunities towards our shared goal uh, that exists between helping professions and the security sector, which of course is, is public safety. So I guess opportunity is sort of the key word here in, in, in what I'm talking about. Um, how do we understand and address risk um, beyond risk and assessment tools? Um, you know, and how do we think about how we better measure our impact and better direct individuals in need into these services? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Emma Cardelli. I'm a clinical psychologist at Boston Children's Hospital, and I <clears throat> co-direct a multidisciplinary violence prevention program there for youth at risk of targeted violence and terrorism. And I am going to jump right to the point by saying, ultimately, there are some fabulous tools, fabulous tools out there to assess and manage risk, to assess threat. And yet, from my perspective as a treater, a lot of those tools are not necessarily useful to me as a mental health clinician for actual treatment. What does that mean? What do I do then, right? Given the fact that there are some fantastic tools, but not necessarily tools that truly can guide my intervention, per se, as a treater. In addition, and many of you, I, you're all friendly faces that I've seen in other panels for the past two days. Uh, you've probably heard me or some of my other colleagues talk about the fact that we don't get great training <laughs> within clinical psychology and other disciplines in general and graduate school around assessing and managing violence risk. So, okay, I don't have very many tools as a treater and I'm not getting great training in my doctoral program to really assess and manage violence risk. Understandably then, there's gonna be, you know, fear, discomfort, reticence in providers to work with this population. And I think we're all in agreement that Although mental illness does not cause, let's say, mass violence, mental health professionals still are, need to play a role in reducing hate-based violence, right, or hate-fueled violence. So what then do we do? <laughs> um, you know, our team at Boston Children's Hospital has been, I think, grappling with this issue and trying to figure out, well, as treaters, how do we, how do we support these kids? What needs to happen in order to help these kids who are vulnerable to or at risk of targeted violence and terrorism, how do, we, how do we provide intervention that truly gets at the drivers of risk here? And how do we accurately identify those drivers? So our team is developing a tool that, in short, is called the TSAM. Um, we have some wonderful CP3 funding to do that. Thank you <laughs> so much, Jenny. It's, uh, so the TSAM, in like core features of it. I'm just going to walk you guys through some kind of key principles of the TSAM. And if anyone wants to talk about the specific elements of that, of that tool, happy to do so either in this conversation or offline, find me somewhere. I'm more than happy to tell you about it. But the bottom line is that it centers, the it centers understanding the client's experience of the world as critical to the assessment process. It really encourages a collaborative approach to understanding the client rather than a top-down assessment process where we're just kind of collecting data. It incorporates an assessment of 
values and virtues, not just mental health symptoms, values, virtues, social embeddedness as a critical part of helping people get off a path to violence. And it directly links assessment results to treatment planning. So, for example, within the first, you know, session where either let's say you're working with a client and you hear something concerning, you pull out this tool, maybe you already have a previous report or somebody's coming to see you directly because of this risk. This first session when you're using this tool, you are simultaneously collaboratively treatment planning with that client and creating a treatment plan together that's going to directly address drivers to violence risk. So it really encourages practitioners to tailor interventions to a client's unique individualized needs rather than taking a one-size-fits-all approach, because we know, as John was saying, it's a diverse population with lots of different needs. Uh, It also then helps practitioners to understand what to reassess at every single client contact. So I know risk is dynamic. How do I attend to it every single time I'm seeing somebody? What do I need to make sure I'm prioritizing as part of those subsequent clinical encounters to make sure I truly am addressing violence risk rather than other things that might be adjacent to that risk but not necessarily really getting at it. Um, It requires the practitioner to consider other data sources too beyond just client self-report and understanding risks and needs more broadly. And it encourages consultation and collaboration with other providers from both similar and different disciplines uh, in accordance with multidisciplinary team approaches, which you've heard us all talk about today. So we're super excited about this tool. I've been working on it quite a bit (laughs) over the past year and are getting ready to pilot it both within our program and Life After Hate. I'm pointing to Sarah Winnegar Budge (laughs) right over here. Um, So we'll be piloting it in the next two months, we're going to start our piloting programming. And then we're also partnering with the McCain Institute, the Prevention Practitioners Network specifically, to offer training in the tool to mental health providers across the country. We're going to pull together a cohort of about 30 mental health providers later this winter. Anybody interested, please come find me. Uh, We'll be offering a training in the tool and then setting up a subsequent community of practice, right? Recognizing that we're all going to need to learn together um, on who is this tool best suited for and why, what's working, what's not working. So we'll have subsequent consultation. Anyone wants to be a part of that, again, please feel free to find me. So those are our next steps. Um, I'm Dr. Rachel Nielsen. I'm a clinical psychologist in Colorado. And um, I do want to talk about our current project, but I wanted to lay out a little bit of you know, the past five years or so in Colorado about how our state has uh, tackled the issue of targeted violence. Um, in part because it's a new concept for a lot of people, uh, especially our frontline providers are teachers, mental health clinicians, or school resource officers, or hospitals. And so we, we realized in examining this issue that we really are in the awareness building phase, that we need to get general education out to as many people as will uh, sit and listen to what we have to say. So um, similar to suicide prevention, I think there are a lot of parallels to pull from and crossover within cases. Um, that just like with suicide prevention, how we learned that the more we talk about it, the more we explain to our children, that we have conversations early and often, that we can tackle this issue of violence, racism, identity-based harms um, in the same way. So Colorado is lucky in that we do have a number of systems in place that are already well-funded, robust, um, like Safe to Tell, which is a, um, an app and a phone number where kids in K through 12 can uh, call in any kind of concern. So sometimes it's bullying, sometimes it's a friend who's expressing suicidal ideation, but it could also be someone who has a gun on campus or is posting things about um, Uh, ISIS or wanting to be the next school attacker, and we're finding that more and more so 
Um, these things are trending younger. Kids are aware of what their peers are doing. Parents tend to notice that there's some kind of change, but um, those are individuals that are probably going to go to the professionals in their community, right? So uh, a few years ago, um, I did work with the Colorado Resilience Collaborative, and that was um, a brick and mortar building at a university, excuse me. <clears throat> and the idea was that by having somewhere other than a law enforcement agency that people could go, that you know, we would expect that parents and concerned uh, parties and people that um, tend to be on the receiving end of these harms would have a place to go for therapy, for resources, for guidance. And ultimately, it ended up being professionals that were coming to us. So if we're using the idea that um, building capacity and building competence across our um, first-line workers, that will create reach into the communities that, say, I as an individual am never going to be able to have. Um, if we can put tools and training in place, then communities can drive their own interventions in ways that make sense for their dynamics. So um, at this stage, we're really just trying to get out a lot of training to folks. Um, we uh, are also a recipient of Homeland Security money to um, build a training, but not just a PowerPoint training, um, because what we found is only about 16% of what is learned in a cool PowerPoint presentation is actually taken back to the workplace mm -hmm. and utilized. So uh, I think we've all had that experience of, that was cool, but now what? And so um, that's literally what people would come up and ask. Like, this is so amazing. I understand my role, but how do I do this work? What does it look like? So, um, so the training that we're doing now is a threat assessment and management training. I'm already feeling like that wording is going to have to evolve yes. because it really is behavioral case management at the end of the day. And taking away the psychobabble that we all love using and uh, having some universal language that multiple disciplines can, uh, can use and make sense to everybody, right? So. Things like um, collapsing different models like Calhoun and Weston, like these, you know, staircase pathway models, right, that, that we have gained from looking at ISIS, right, looking at terrorism, looking at very specific workplace violence, for example. Um, but all of those really can be collapsed into four, st four steps. So one is figuring out what is normal behavior. And I think we need to talk about that in 2022 with our kids. What is normal? What is typical teenage behavior? Because much of what we're seeing, the angst, the rhetoric, the interest in these movements um, may not necessarily be a problem. But where do we say it's normal? And where do we say it's ne now in the next phase, which would be boundary probing? They're being provocative. They're pushing the envelope. They're seeing if anyone will notice or say something or be offended. Uh, and then the next stage up from that would be attack related, where this is not just being disruptive, um, upsetting to others, uh, using these chat forums for inappropriate language, but that someone is actually talking about an attack, a target, um, uh, a grievance, something that they will not uh, abide by, and they're going to do something about it. 85% um, of threats are veiled. They're not direct. So it'll be something like, you might not want to be here on Monday, or keep pushing me and see what happens, right? And then that final phase is attack. So if we could look at behavior along that trajectory, how close is someone to attack? Uh, we find that that's more helpful when we're um, designing interventions for teams. 
Um, like my colleagues were saying, uh, a psychological assessment helps us understand that individual, could help with some treatment planning. Um, a risk assessment tool is helpful when you're triaging somebody who has a known history um, or looking at recent behavior. The TRAP-18 is a wonderful tool um, because it does consider static and dynamic factors. Um, but threat assessment is really designed not to help the individual per se. It's to determine who needs to be in the know, how do you target Harden, how do you protect, um, and then what are your uh, countermeasures. So what we, um, what we used to think was that the best predictor of future behavior was past behavior. And that makes sense, right? That if there's a pattern, you would expect it to continue unless there was an intervention. And then the most predictive uh, piece is what someone does after that intervention. So it's really um, getting teams to um, all come from their roles, their lanes. What can the school resource officer do? What can the mental health clinician do? How do we talk to the parents? All of that can hap happen simultaneously. And then you're essentially like trial and error. Did that work? Was that effective with that individual? Or did they go underground or go around your intervention? And then you know you have a more serious situation. So our goal is really to always uh, <laughs> try to work ourselves out of a job by um, creating competency and networking so that these teams that already work with, um, work with youth and people involved in concerning behavior can incorporate this because I do think that um, people do need to understand that when there's an ideological bend, um, if you have an angry person who already feels aggrieved, um, giving them the ide ideological justification is like fuel on the fire. So I do want people to understand that it is, it is different, it's something to know about, uh, and yet there's nothing new under the sun. Number two, number two, right, thank you, here we go. Um, so I feel like this is a nice way to kind of have some considerations with some limitations that I, I think Rachel hit on some key points as well that uh, is a nice segue. I, I wanna say this, I, I've done in some respect either a triage or full comprehensive risk assessment. I've done well over 3,000 of them in the last five years. So you know, I have a lot of experience in this and, and a lot of takeaways. Uh, from exposure to using a variety of different tools from the TRAP to the waiver to the HCR20. And we could sit here and we could ramble off for you lists of things that you could also easily Google. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's really the best use of time. So I want to ask you to kind of consider um, when you're approaching assessment, treatment planning, it really doesn't matter. We can use the language interchangeably here because the principles will apply. Yeah. To think about your mindset as the assessor in whatever context when you go into this. So a couple things I think are really important is how we go into it and how we frame this uh, can be really impactful for the information that we get and the information that we're able to get from that person that they need us to know. I believe in the concept or this idea that what somebody needs you to know is always more important than anything you wanna know from them. Mm -hmm. Because if you listen, and you take the time to hear what the person has to say, you're working on establishing connection. And through connection, we build trust, which we heard mentioned here already. And through trust, we get disclosure and engagement, and that's how we get the information. It's a pretty safe bet that if you're familiar with some of these instruments and the tools and the empirical data that they're looking for, as you just get to know them, don't just study them, don't just take a test and learn them and say, here's what I have to do. Mm -hmm. Understand them, appreciate them, what are the operational definitions of the things that I'm looking for? That is going to, if you know it, then you don't even need it in front of you. And you're just going to inherently and automatically start to look to elicit the information from those people. And through open-ended conversations, you probably have been and will continue to get the information and the data points you want. But being familiar with the tools, which is our research, 
it's going to just make you more aware and likely to latch on to those pieces of information when they come to your attention where we might overlook them. That's where our bias can get in the way because we say this isn't important. So risk assessment tools do a great job at keeping us focused in the lane that we need to be focused on so we don't let those other distractions and white noise lead us down a path where our response could be disproportionate and potentially consequential mm -hmm. for yourself or for the person. Mm -hmm. A couple things to think about too when you do this. Any instrument that you get is going to be formatted relatively similarly. You're going to start with stable, go into dynamic risk factors, and then you have protective factors. And there may be one or two of those at the end, unless you're using a tool like the SAPROF, which is only protective yes. factors. So I think what some of us agree on here is that unless you have a battery of a significant number of assessment tools, you're going to miss pieces of information. One of them will be looking for targeted violence towards other people. Another one is looking at targeted violence towards oneself. But we also know there's a significant intersection between these different typologies of violence that makes me ask, how can we afford to only be paying attention to one or two and not the others? We know, as we heard some data already, that there's a significant overlap between suicidality and risk of targeted violence towards others. Mm -hmm. The ranges can be anywhere from 30% leading up to an attack all the way to 50 or higher during and post. I can't get away, so I will end my life. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing to consider. We know there's a significant overlap with murder-suicide, a poorly titled construct considering that suicide is the preliminary or the precursory experience that drives somebody to hurt other people. I'd ask you when we talk about what are the risk factors that you only consider it to be a framework of a moment in time of the person that you're sitting in front of. It does not capture all of who they are. It's looking at that person about a specific thing about them that you want to know. And if we continue to call them risk factors, I fear that we are going to only be receiving the information with this veil of fear in front of us that doesn't allow us to use those data points as effectively as we could. So if we reframe them, change the verbiage a little bit, and I, some of the folks here have heard me say this before, if we think about risk factors as unmet needs, it connotes the need for us to take action on what we're hearing. Yeah. Risk factor, risk as a de descriptive word, almost tells us this is something you need to be afraid of, be fearful, and we may be apt to take a step back from the person, as opposed to, well, I know that a history of physical violence may be a risk factor, so uh, I, I want to understand it in the context that the person has used it, and also that this is not just a risk factor I should be scared of, but it's an unmet need. The unmet need is I struggle to control my behavior sometimes. I need help with that. Mm -hmm. As opposed to this is a violent person, let me keep a distance for myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't take precautions to be safe when you're doing assessments, but at the same time, we don't want to get stuck in us perpetrating and, per and continuing the sense of stigma that we're trying to fight. In essence, we could be doing more harm than good. Um, so I'll close with this because I know that we're short on time and if we have other questions. The idea is building connection is always really paramount to anything else as well. Uh, that's what any of us are going to be more likely to engage and share ourselves with other people, to people to whom we feel connected. So we always need to bring our authentic self into that space. And if you just stick with what the tool that you're using, should you choose one, tells you to look for, you're going to miss a lot of really key data points about that person that really matter to them. Think outside the box. There could be a risk factor that's not included in that assessment tool. There could be a protective factor that's not there. And I would start there. Start with the protective factors. That's the positive stuff. We know that the presence of one protective factor can decrease risk by 50%. You add in another protective factor, it can decrease that risk already reduced by another 50%. But yet we start with the risk or the concerning factors. Mm -hmm. I'll ask you quickly, picture yourself in a session with a patient or whatever the role is of that person, and they tell you as you're asking them about things that could be concerning that they derive certain pleasure from some very bizarre sexual fantasy. Well, if that's not yours that you share, it's going to be very difficult to think outside of what you just heard, especially if it's very violent, graphic, unusual. And as they're telling you all the good stuff that may be used as mitigating factors that you can latch on to to support them through this, how are you not thinking about that other thing in the back of your head that's a little bit of white noise? Yes, I know you're good at this. Yes, I know you have family, but I also know what you do with the bodies buried under the floor of your house. 
so to speak. It's hard to get past that. So let's start and shift and think with the positive. What's working well for you? What are your strengths? This is very social worky, strengths-based approach, but it doesn't have to be defined to a particular discipline. Lead with your heart, not with your head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is going to get you to the soul or the essence of the person, and that's who we want to understand, and that's what that person wants you to understand about them. Lead with your heart and getting to know their heart. <laughs> thank you. We'll add that. <laughs> well, thank you. So I am Jenny Presswell. I'm so sorry that I came in late. I am the acting director of the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Um, our office works to coordinate the government's response to prevent targeted violence and terrorism. And I have to say, I've been doing this work for 16 years. This panel, the fact that it exists and we have all of this information for people in the audience is groundbreaking. <laughs> Five years ago, we weren't even really um, talking about uh, any number of mental health providers that were working on this. We were talking about the need for it, but how does it happen? So the fact that we have not, all, not just all of you here today, but expertise to offer to the audience is, is fantastic. And thank you for being the people on the front of this, making this happen. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, I know we've talked a lot about the different tools. We talked about some risk assessment tools. We talked about threat assessment. But I am curious, let's take a step back. What is reporting like? How do people come to you? How are they reported? What are the barriers that you would recommend we overcome in reporting and how do we overcome those? And once they come to you, depending on how they were reported, does that impact what your treatment plan is? Go ahead. Oh, I, I'm happy to speak to that. I, I would, I'll start with the last part of that question. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that it necessarily impacts the treatment plan, threat mitigation plan, whatever you want to call it at all. Um, I think reporting is just simply we got the information. And then it's up to us as a multidisciplinary team, which is how we look at these things, to collectively look at this and determine what's the most appropriate proportionate intervention. And we'll do that with the person that we're concerned about as well. So they're a stakeholder in their own um, plan. I think keys to reporting, look, we have this rhetoric and this discourse out there, this concept of see something, say something, and various versions of that. But the problem is the biggest barrier to getting people to report is we spend more time printing this and putting this on poster board and we're not really teaching people what exactly they're supposed to see, right? What are you supposed to look for? And then they fall into the dis distorted narrative that, well, I'm gonna look for the mentally ill guy with a gun who's probably served time in the military and, and that's probably who I should look for, which was exactly the headline after the Thousand Oaks bar shooting. You know, former Marine goes and kills people. Now every military and serviceman is a danger to us. So I think that part of what promotes and stimulates reporting is not only just the logistic of giving them access and multiple avenues to report and speak up and say something, but infusing a form of training and education in your programs for your organization that teach people what it actually means to see something and say something. And beyond that, what I think is most important is the last part, is if you don't close the loop with people who have reported and let them know that something happened, something was done, even if it's not what they wanted you to do, which is 90% of the scenarios for us because they're acting on emotion. If you don't close the loop, then they're not gonna have any faith and it's gonna challenge the fidelity of your program. So make sure, and in closing that loop, there's another touch point for education as well. Hey, here's what we did, here's why we did it. We didn't do this and here's why. So you have talking points in those moments. I think in Canada, if I can just speak, uh, so we're, we have, my mic working? Oh, right. In Canada, uh, so we have a, a duty to warn, duty to report. Um, it's a catch-22, everyone who's referred to us as homicidal, <laughs> <laughs> right? So um, the law enforcement's aware of that. So what's important here, and we've had a couple situations come up recently, is that relationships with, with law enforcement that you know something was said during a, a you know a family counseling session that was pretty clear uh i am obligated to have a conversation with law enforcement but also you know with all of our local police divisions and even our national security apparatus we have liaison people we work with they know the case we're working on because they've referred it 
and, you know, and they really place a lot of trust in their team around where do you think this is going to go? And you know, we'll kind of do an assessment. Well, this is in the context of, of, a, of a family counseling session that was triggered by something the family said to the youth. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a real discussion that happens there. Of course, we don't give details about what that was, but it's, so it's, we're in a tight situation where we have to report. What's different about this space is compared to regular social work we do in our agency is that we don't have that connection with all the other people that come in to see us. We would just report to the police and someone might get arrested. Here, there's a bit of a negotiation that can happen, a bit of massaging of where, where are we at with this? Well, how can they be helpful to us or vice versa? So I think having those partnerships and, and liaison officers that work between sort of the investigators and the community agencies is really critical. Mm -hmm. I echo everything David just said in terms of our program in Boston. That, I know we're at red, yeah, so that's red. all I'm going to say, but <laughs> I echo everything. Sure. So um, one final question. Risk assessment, threat assessment. A lot of you have talked about risk assessment tools. Rachel really spoke about threat assessment. I know Richard uses that as well. I'm curious, very quickly, which do you like better? Do you think you need both? Um, do you have any opinions on, on how that works? I, I just want to say that I think they're complementary. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, we've, we've had one of our police departments uh, in Colorado create their own tool that had a risk assessment piece and a threat management piece. And so, you know, my soapbox is just to not use them interchangeably mm -hmm. um, because you really are getting two different outcomes, two different products. So just like psychological assessment, risk mm -hmm. assessment, threat assessment, all, all different, mm -hmm. but all useful in their own way. I completely agree. Yeah, completely mm -hmm. agree. Precisely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like from what I heard consistently from each of you, there's a number of risk assessment tools. No tool is perfect. Same thing with threat assessment and threat management. There's mm -hmm. many different tools for that. So trying to find a good combination and combining that with really good, um, a, a good approach to counseling and therapy that connects with the individual. That's, that's what I'm taking away from this session. Um, I think we're at the end of our time, so I don't know if there's any question from the audience in the last minute or so that we have. All right, Brett, Brett wants to raise his hand, but he's not going to do it. <laughs> 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 all right, well, fantastic. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much to our audience.